Okay, let's uh, let's start this. So today we want to talk about authentication, and uh, let's just dive into it. I don't have a good intro. Uh, you've seen authentication before. I guarantee it. You've uh, you're familiar with this concept. So uh, uh, so what we want to do here is have this idea of user accounts, where instead of just visiting our page and having the same experience for every user, we're going to uh, we're going to modify the content of the page based on a particular user, and we're going to change that content when they're logged in to our site. So when they log into our app, we're going to treat that that user as a specific user and serve them content specific to them. So like when you log into something and visit uh, any site, you know you're going to see your recommendations, you're going to see your follows, you're going to see um, your friends list. You know it's things personalized to you depending on what site you're visiting that's what we want to do we want to change features based on the user and we want to remember that user uh, of course on monday we're going to use cookies to remember the user we won't get into that today today we want to do the authentication part of that so authentication you're all familiar with this you go to a site the site requires an account you register for an account when you register you're going to choose a username and password and when you authenticate or log in i'll, I'll use the term authenticate when you authenticate, you're going to provide that same username and password. And if the username and password match the ones that you provided during registration, you're, lo you're now logged into the app, and then you get your specific content, content specific to you. Maybe your emails, your messages, your DMs, you know, everything specific to you and your account. And anybody who has not authenticated and not provided that username and password cannot see your personalized content. Pretty pretty ubiquitous these days. I assume everybody's familiar with this part. This slide should not be a surprise to anyone, uh, especially anyone who's seeing me right now. You might have even created an account, especially if you're in chat. You've created an account just to see me and uh, watch this lecture. Um, maybe you're watching on Twitch or YouTube without an account. I'd be kind of surprised, though. I think, uh, I think accounts are... Pretty ubiquitous that you you log into your apps these days. So there's a a, a lot of uh, infrastructure implied here. When we register that username and password, we're usually going to associate that with an email, and. Uh, has anybody I want to ask this as a question actually maybe discuss has anyone thought about why so many sites want you to associate your your username to an email account I guess I have the answer right on the slide but so you can sell your email of course so that's what I thought for a long time too that they just want to sell my email address I, I think the more common reason, because not all sites are selling your email address, I think the more common reason is to limit the number of bots that can join the site. So I actually had a Q&A site set up for 115 where uh, where users can, or spam us emails. Well, I, I think companies are pretty good at reducing the spam, or at least giving you the option. Emails can be used as primary keys, absolutely. So email is a primary key. Nobody else can have your email address. That's a unique identifier. It identifies you on the internet. So that's definitely one of the reasons too. And of course, the spam and selling your email are reasons for certain companies. They'll do that stuff. Uh, one big one is another big one. I like all these answers, by the way. Uh, the one I'll add is that there are a lot of bots out there who will create accounts, use random email addresses if they're asked for one, random passwords, random usernames, and the bots will try to spam the site itself. So if the site requires email verification, well, these bots can't go open an email address for every single spam account that they create and verify that email address. They, they would have to create an email account for each one. So they're going to have to do the same thing over at some email service, and that's going to get difficult for them. Uh, so this really limits the number of bots that can spam the site because the bots can't just auto, you know, find your form, find your registration form, create an account, log in, and start spamming. 
you can't have that completely automated if you have email verification. Uh, and they, the bots would have to know what your verification email looks like. So I had a site for 115 once upon a time, just a couple of semesters. I tried it out. I actually kind of liked it. It had its problems. I might go back to it someday. But anyway, it was a QA and a site. It was a Stack Overflow clone. So instead of a Piazza, and I might revisit it next semester because uh, Piazza is going to a paid pay to play model, and um, and this site it just uh, kind of mirrored. It was an open source site, but uh, open source project, but it mirrored Stack Overflow. So instead of a Piazza style, you had a Stack Overflow style where you ask a question, people can give you answers, you can upvote, downvote, and uh, uh, it, and it gives you recommended like as the, the my favorite feature was as a student is typing up a question says oh i'm going to ask this silly question right below that question it would say here are three questions that look very similar to what you're typing are you sure this hasn't already been answered and then they could be like oh yeah hey that's my question and then they click on that and then get their answer it really significantly reduced the spam in the questions that students send Whereas Piazza doesn't do that, and you all know how Piazza works. You get the same question 50,000 times because nobody reads any of the previous questions. Uh, so I might go back to it. Anyway, I, I released this app, and I noticed that a lot of students were signing up. I looked at my signups, and I got, uh, you know, in the first couple of weeks, there were like uh, a couple hundred signups. You know, I think there were 500 students in the class, so I'm happy. I look a couple days later, there's like 400. I'm like, oh, man. There's a lot of participation this semester. This is great. I look a few days later, and there's like a thousand. I'm like, okay, are they each creating two accounts? What's going on here? Months go by, and and uh, probably not months, maybe because I was so distracted just teaching. But after a while, I notice it's in the tens of thousands of accounts being created. I'm like, okay, this doesn't add up. So I start looking through the logs, and that's exactly what's happening. I was getting botted. Uh, the bots were attacking the the site and creating uh, just creating ridiculous amounts of accounts uh, at a rate of like once one account every couple of seconds was being created a ridiculous amount a huge volume of accounts being created by these bots. Uh, luckily, I had email verification and you had to have a buffalo.edu email address to to actually post. So none of these bots could actually make posts. They weren't getting their spam out there. But they were trying. They were creating accounts and uh, attacking the site. So it's easy to think, well, I don't have to have email verification because those bots aren't going to get me. Hell, that's what I thought. Uh, but those bots are scanning everything. They're scanning the Internet constantly, not looking necessarily for you, but they look for vulnerabilities. So I assume these bots look for that specific open source project, look for those deployments. And then once they find a deployment of that specific app, they go and do their thing or maybe that app just follows a, a generic registration form maybe they did what all of you all you know mostly y'all are doing in your projects and taking the documentation and barely changing it which, by the way not not that cool guys um and uh and then just since it follows such a similar pattern that the bots are able to attack that uh, but whatever it was i was definitely getting hit by the bots they're out there they're real uh you know, it's a real thing. Uh, so, so why verify email? Uh, I'm not gonna. That's my example. Uh, I I might have wiped the database. I don't know. I have gone into the database before and showed that during the lecture. Uh, I I think I might have wiped the database. No, I took down the app. I I never went into the database. I I just showed you through the app. But I took down the app because uh, uh, I don't like the bots attacking it. So. Uh, so on the server, this implies that we have to store your username and your password. And this is the bulk of what we're, we want to talk about. So for, by the way, registration, authentication, I don't think I have to say anything about this. I think any one of you could code this up. We know how forms work. This is two forms. Store this. When you get this, look up the password and check if the passwords match. So I don't think there's much that we have to talk about. Uh, maybe after lecture, Jory, maybe I'll, I'll pull it up. I'll, I'll try the apps not running right now. So I'd have to go in, uh, remember how to rerun it. Remember what commands to, to punch in, run it, and then go to the site. 
Um, so I won't do that during lecture because I waste too much time doing it. Doesn't Piazza do something similar? No. But like showing you the, the similar questions? No, it doesn't. That's why you get so many duplicates on Piazza. So I'm confident you can all build authentication. Like there's not a whole lot to talk about on that aspect. What we do need to talk about is securely storing passwords. That's the, the major topic in authentication. So on the server, it's implied that we have to store usernames and passwords. We have to associate this username with this password. So my question is, who can read those passwords? So first of all, what if your database is attacked? Somebody hits you with a SQL injection attack. Uh, you're, you're not sanitizing your inputs and or you're not preparing your statements. And somebody hits you with a SQL injection, gets everybody's username and password. Oh, crap. Now, now one attacker has everybody's credentials, can log in as anybody, and you got to send out mass emails and say, hey, everybody, change your password quick. And most people won't. Uh, that's a disaster site. So you don't want to store your password in plain text where somebody can, oh, man. Uh, I, I deleted my one of my favorite slides. Uh, so an attacker can get your password if they're stored in plain text like this, but also who else has access to that password? Who else has access to the database? Maybe the admins of the site, maybe the developers at the company, maybe the executives at that company. A lot of people have access to that database who should have access to that database. So do you trust everybody? Do you trust everybody who has that access? to not do anything silly like what if you uh what if you have an issue with the website and you end up getting in a an argument with one of the admins or somebody on support you create a support ticket and you know they don't treat you the way you'd like to be treated or whatever are you confident that that person's not going to go steal your username and password i don't know i wouldn't be so we don't want to store the passwords in plain text. We don't just store passwords. We don't just say, hey, thanks for the password. Let me store this. We never, never, ever do that. We do not store our passwords in plain text. This is similar to never trust your users. Well, never trust your admins either. That one, that one sounds a bit worse now that I say it out loud. <clears throat> but don't trust like your developers. Don't trust you know everybody on the team. Uh, you don't want everybody having access to these passwords. So what we want to do is store only hashes and actually salted hashes when we get to the end of this, salted hashes of these passwords. So not even the admins of the website can know your password. If you ever contact support and you're like, dude, just I forgot my password. Can you just tell me my password? I don't want to reset my password. I just want to know my password. They can't tell you that. They literally can't. Never trust anyone. Good advice. Uh, I like trust but verify is one of my, uh, I like that saying a lot. Uh, so not even the admins. You get the, the sysadmin, the, the head of the tech department at a company. They still don't know your password. They don't know your password. Nobody knows your password. And that's the way we want it. We don't want anybody to know our passwords at all. Nobody knows our passwords. So we're going to achieve that through hashing, through salting and hashing. So a hash function is a function that's going to take a value. So we want to uh, use a hash function and store a hash of the password. Call the hash function on our plain text, generate a hash, and then store the hash. A hash function is a function with certain properties. It's going to take in some value and return a value with certain properties, usually something like fixed length. We use these to, to build things like hash tables, among other things. Uh, but hash tables are built on top of hash functions. And hash functions themselves do not add any security. This is a common misconception. I like having this slide just to make sure you know that if you if you have a hash function, that hash function is not necessarily secure. It doesn't add anything with security. Hash functions don't have anything to do with security. If you have a cryptographic hash function, those can be used for security. And I will use the common shorthand. I'll, from now on, I'll just say hash functions when I mean cryptographic hash function, which is where the confusion comes from, but I'm still going to do it. Um, but just because you have a hash function doesn't mean it's a cryptographic hash function. 
So some to be some misconception that I don't want to see any of you making a cryptographic hash function is meant for security. It's meant to be a one way function. You give it a value, you get an output. And the whole idea is that you can't take that output and generate the input that produced that output. You can't, if I have a password and I want to take a hash of it, I want to get a hash that looks like this in such a way that if somebody has this, they can't go back to my password. And this hash is actually just a hash of the literal string password with all lowercase letters. Looking at this string, you shouldn't be able to tell that that's the word password, that that was the input string. Uh, so this is what we want. We store these hashes and we're good. Nobody can read that password, right? Lecture over, we're done. <clears throat> Just hash it. So one hash function we like to use is SHA-256. There are other hash functions. There, SHA-3 is out now. If you want to use SHA-3, knock yourself out. Uh, uh, but uh, SHA-256, and here's a, a link to a calculator. If you want to find this calculator without my slides, just type... SHA-256 calculator is the first or second hit. But if I type in hello, compute the hash, I should get... Is that the same hash? That looks different than the one I have in my slides. Because I typed hello and not password. And that should be, let's see, A-A-B-B-D-D. -D. That's a pretty unique substring. That should be in there somewhere. This is the SHA-256 hash of password. If we go to the that previous slide, A B B B D D. Uh, SHA-256 is an algorithm. It's a cryptographic hash function, and it's an algorithm. It's not an implementation of an algorithm. This is a confusion that we see in 331 a lot. This is an algorithm. So any implementation of this algorithm in any language, anywhere, should have the same exact behavior. And let's see if I... Give me one sec. I think I can do it this way. So I'm going to switch between IntelliJ. Uh, IntelliJ, my slides quickly. Yeah, there we go. Not this one. Give me one sec. I'm almost there. And there I just need to... Uh, Get to a point where I can change things. All right. So if we take, so this is Java. If I take password and I want to compute the hash of that, and I just want to print out this hash, run this program, I'm going to get the same exact hash that we saw in our slides. No, oh, and you can see I use this example quite a bit. Oh, that's embarrassing. Come on. Compute hash, plain text, no salt. No, we don't want to do that. Shot 256. Is it because I'm base 64 encoding it? Because that is a base 64 encoding. I'm going to get back to the. Man, did I change this code around? I don't like that. Well, we'll 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 come back to that. Maybe I'll skip that demo. I don't know why I I would be base sixty four encoding that. Why would I break my code, and then not tell myself? Yeah, there there are different shot algorithms, but they're pretty much the same purpose. I think we use shot two fifty six for this forever. There, like, there's shot. Uh, 512, right? Uh, where there's just more bits, I believe. Uh, but they they all have the same purpose. Any any SHA algorithm has the purpose of being a cryptographic hash function. I use SHA-256 in my examples. Just, I don't know. I don't feel like updating my slides. But I think SHA-3 is, is the thing. And SHA-256 is still used, by the way. 
if uh, like if we look at the cert here, it will take a little field trip here. If we look at this cert, I don't know if this one will or not, but yeah, there it is. SHA-256 is being used for this certificate for this very website. Just picking a random website. SHA-256 is still used in, in the world. Don't let anyone tell you it's not. It's still a very common thing. Uh, and this is what SHA-256 looks like. I'm not going to get into the details of it, but it's a lot of bitwise operations. A lot of, a lot of bit level stuff. I'm not getting into the details. If you're interested in the details, uh, you know, go look it up uh, somewhere else or take a security class. Uh, the the high level idea is that you're going to XOR, do a lot of XORing of these bits. You're going to split the input into chunks and then handle them all separately and then put them through this circuit and then put it through again and then put it through again and put it through again and just keep cycling it through this until the input is completely unrecognizable. And this is set up in a way that you can't just jam it in reverse. You can't go backwards on this easily anyway. It's probably possible, but uh, nobody's found and shared, at least. Nobody's publicly shared an efficient way to do that with SHA-256. So we're good, right? We, we've hashed. We're storing hashes. hashes. We're done, right? Well, not quite. So the problem with this is there. there's one huge vulnerability, and, and this is another huge misconception, surprisingly common misconception, that, that people make. I've seen in published peer-reviewed papers where people are making this misconception. I've hashed the things, therefore nobody can read the things. So we're done. We're secure. This is incredibly false. You, This is not even close, not even remotely true. Just because you hash something doesn't mean you're secure, and it doesn't mean that people can't read the plain text of that hash they can still find the plain text of that hash here's an easy attack we we know we can't take the hash and go backwards and find the plain text so let's just go forward let's use the hash function the way it's intended to be used and just brute force this just guess every possible password and hash every possible password hash every guess we make and if the hash matches the hash that we're trying to crack that's it that's the the input it's as simple as that. Like, that's that's it. That's an attack. So, if you have, and especially if you have a really weak password, it's not going to take long to eventually guess your password. Like, our password that's literally the string password, that's going to be one of the first guesses somebody takes. They're going to guess that. The hash is going to match. They're going to say, oh, your password is literally password. And then they go to the site and log in. Uh, to launch this attack, they would have to have your hash. So this assumes that they already have access to the database or they've successfully pulled off a SQL injection attack. They've somehow gotten the hash of your password. And then offline, they're going to perform this brute force attack, crack your hash, and then go to the site and enter that password after they've cracked it. So you don't have to worry about uh, like being limited, having a limited number of login attempts or anything like that. They're just going to, on their own machine, which might be a very powerful machine with a big GPU in it, throwing millions of hashes, billions of hashes uh, at this per second, potentially, and cracking that password. Very simple attack. So just because you're hashing, and, and take the, the ultimate, uh, want, um, the ultimate example, let me just get to the next slide first, is, uh, so we measure how secure hash is by how much entropy the input has, or how much entropy the plain text has. Entropy is a number, the number of guesses that need to be made to, uh, to figure out what the underlying data is. In security terms, entropy is used in other terms as well. But for security purposes, it's the number of guesses that need to be made to guarantee that you crack that hash uh, for our context. Uh, we typically measure this as bits of entropy, which is the log base 2 of the number of guesses that need to be made because these numbers start getting big and kind of meaningless. Uh, we take the log base 2 so we can start wrapping our heads around them. And then about 80 bits of entropy is considered to be secure. If you have 80 bits or more, we're calling it good. Because that's a ridiculously large number. So think of the, the absolute worst case scenario. Is you have one bit of entropy, which means there are two possible guesses. So maybe somebody asks uh, you a question. 
a yes or no question. Your answer is either yes or it's no. And you don't want anybody reading your answer, so you hash it and then send a hash. Well, anybody attacking that only has to try two guesses. They they hash yes, they hash no. One of those is going to match your hash, and they know what you said. They know what your answer was. There's no security involved there. No security at all. So let's start measuring some entropy. If we get if we have a 26 character alphabet, we have only the lowercase letters and we have a two letter password. The number of possible combinations that we can have is 26 squared. We can have 26 choices for the first first letter, 26 choices for the second letter, and we have 676 total uh, uh, total that's small. Are you sure, Pro Robo? Uh, I I'd like to see you guess that many things. Uh, so this uh, no no it is two to the eighty. You're right, but that that's a huge number. Like, that's a huge number. Uh, so. Uh, so at 26 squared, you know what? Since Pro Robo's doing this, let's uh, let, we might want to go to the code. But if we have 26 squared, we have 676 guesses or zero security. If you add uppercase letters, you have 2704 or zero security. Uh, but let's go to the code and try a couple different numbers. Oh, I gotta go up here. Let's uh let's tone this down a little. So let's take how many guesses we think an attacker can make per second. I'm gonna do thousand, million, billion, ten billion, sure. We'll give him ten billion guesses per second. And what I want to measure is how long that's going to take an attacker to crack a password. Where's my main method? Why do I have this in such a crappy state? You know, I've used this code code example so many times that I didn't bother taking a look at it, but apparently I have it in a kind of crappy state. All right, so let's try two to the 80. This is what we consider secure. And I won't bother explaining the code, but I'll explain what it does is it's going to compute the number of possible guesses that have to be made. One, two, just double checking to make sure it matches what Pro Robo has in chat. 80 bits of entropy. If that attacker has 10 billion, can make 10 billion guesses per second, it's going to take 3.8 million years to crack that password. That's how big of a number this is. So Pro Robo, when you say that's pretty small to guess, I want to know what kind of hardware you're running, where you can make, I mean, how many guesses would you need? Oh, it's below it. Like 10 billion, 10 trillion, 10 quadrillion? To, to get down to four years. So if you get 10 quadrillion guesses per second, which I guess isn't, I don't, I don't know, may, maybe? Uh, that's a lot of computing power. That's a million machines all making 10 billion guesses per second. It, it's a lot. I mean, it's like a small probability. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're, you're, on my, you're on my side on that. Never mind. I thought you meant like, oh, 1 times 10 to the 24? We got this. So like, we can hack that. I thought you meant it was a pretty small number to guess. Oh, okay, I see. A small probability... Yeah, I see. Okay. You have me panicking there. I'm like, wait, what are you talking about? Uh, so while we're in here, let's play with a few more values. That's uh, uh, that's 80 bits of entropy. Now let's try, what if we have uppercase, lowercase, numbers, special characters. We'll say that the total alphabet size is 90. We have 90 characters to choose from, and we're choosing eight characters completely at random. So we'll satisfy the conditions for most websites. 
eight characters, uppercase, lowercase, special character number. And we're going to assume that we're completely randomly generating these passwords. We have a random password generator. We're not coming up with our own. And, uh, and we generate that password. That's going to take zero years to crack at 51 bits of entropy. Not a very secure password. If you go a little bit beyond that and go, say, 12 completely random characters, now you're getting some com some security. I was getting ahead of my compiler there. Now you're getting some security. A few characters make a huge difference when it comes to security. And let's, hell, let's crank this all the way up to 20. You have a completely random 20 length password. Nobody's cracking this thing. Nobody's ever cracking that thing. The sun will liter literally burn out before anybody cracks your password. Nobody's going to attack your password at this point. I don't even know what this number is. It would take me a while just to trace through this and figure out how large that number is. That's why we use bits of entropy. I know what 129.8 is, and it's gonna take a long time to crack. Even if we do give them 10 quadrillion guesses per second, it's not gonna, it's not gonna do it. He's trolling. He wasn't trolling. I, I was just misreading it. <clears throat> if you narrowed it down to only words, good question. So, the key phrase for the brute force attack is, in the entropy conversation, is if we're purely randomly generating those characters. Each character is chosen completely independently of each other. But that's not how we choose passwords. If you're creating your own password, that's not how you create a password. You're going to create something that's easy for you to remember. Because 20 random characters, uppercase, lowercase, special character numbers, you're never, ever, ever going to remember that number. You're going to have to write it down somewhere, at the very least, th that password. And it's going to take you forever to type. Uh, the only way you get that kind of security is if you're using a password management, if you're using password management software, which you probably should. Honestly, I probably should start using that. I keep saying I should for a long time. Uh, most likely you're going to come up with something that is easy for you to remember. <clears throat> and then the attacker is going to take advantage of that structure. So they're going to not launch a brute force attack. They're going to launch a dictionary attack. This is how an attacker is going to start. And they're going to guess first common passwords. They're going to, you can just type in, you can just search common passwords and you'll get a list of all the most common passwords. And that's where they're going to start. They're going to start with all the common passwords. They're going to start with actual words. That's where the word the dictionary comes from. They're going to start with actual words, common words that people use as passwords. And they're going to use common substitutions as well. At instead of A, zero instead of O, explanation instead of I. They're going to, all the common replacements that I'm sure you do, I do, you know, everybody does. Uh, the attackers know about that. We're not being super clever here. All we're doing is uh, bypassing the restrictions of the site by getting special characters and numbers in there uh, without actually adding much security. So the attackers know this. They're going to do that. They're going to launch their dictionary attack and figure out your password much, much, much faster than a brute force attack. They're not going to launch a brute force attack unless they're desperate. There's also another more advanced type of attack, a rainbow table attack, where I, I don't want to spend too much time. I, I end up spending too much time explaining this often because I think it's fun. Um, so I'll try to do this quick. But instead of attacking your hash once they get your hash, they're going, the attacker is going to pre-compute a lot of hashes. So in a perfect world for the attacker, what they're going to do is pre-compute the hash for every single possible plain text input. Every single input ever. They're going to pre-compute that, store it in a big old table, a big old lookup table that maps hashes to plain text inputs. This is what they would like to do. And then when they get a hash, they just look it up in this huge... Uh, dictionary, this huge hash map, ha hash map of hashes, I guess it would be, uh, look up that hash and then find the plain text. That's what they like to do. That's infeasible. The numbers are just way too massive. Can't do it. So what they do instead is compute chains of hashes where they take a plain text input, they hash it, Apply a function to that to turn the hash into a potential guess of a plain text password, and then hash that again. And then turn that into another guess, and then hash it again, and, and all deterministically. So they compute a chain. Start with one guess, and then have a huge chain of guesses by just continuously rehashing the hash 
and hash the hash of the hash of the hash of the hash. Keep rehashing and get a, this huge long chain. Then they store the first value, the first guess in that chain, and the last hash of that chain. The beginning and end of each chain. Then compute many, many chains. And these chains can be billions, trillions of hashes long. And then for each chain, even when it's trillions of hashes, you're still just storing two values for it. So you're saving a significant amount of space with a rainbow table by representing trillions of hashes potentially with just two values. Now, uh, and then you store billions, trillions of chains, and you can have this huge rainbow table that represents a massive amount of hashes that can easily be looked up. Once you have a hash that you want to crack, you hash it, hash it again, hash it again, hash it again, keep hashing it until you reach one of the endpoints of any one chain. Then you know, that way you know which chain this password belongs to. You go to the beginning of that chain, keep hashing, 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 hashing until you match the hash that you're cracking, and then you back up one step, that's the password. Very efficient. It, it takes a lot of time to generate these rainbow tables, but they're floating around out there. You can download them there. They exist. Um, so it takes a long time to pre-compute them, but th it's already pre-computed. You don't have to use your CPU time or GPU time at the time that you acquire the hash. You do that beforehand. All the computation is already done, and then you just do a little bit of computation to crack a hash. You could crack hashes crazy fast, like nothing. You can just rip through hashes uh, like nothing. This is bad. We don't like this. We don't like the attackers having this much power because this is, I mean, this needs to be nerfed. This is way too much power. To handle that, we use salting. Whenever you store a password, you don't just store a hash of that password. You store a salted hash of that password. A salt will effectively destroy those rainbow tables. Those rainbow tables do not stand a chance against salting. Salting is a pretty simple idea, pretty simple strategy, and it renders those rainbow tables completely useless. Nobody's attacking with rainbow tables anymore because all of us developers, we're all salting our hashes. So those rainbow tables are useless and they have to attack us the old fashioned way, dictionary attacks, brute force attacks. Um, so a salt, what a salt is, is a randomly generated string that's stored in plain text with the hash. So the salt does not add any entropy because we're giving it to the, the attacker. We're saying, here's the salt, here you go. Randomly generated salt, and it's appended to the plain text password before hashing. So our new strategy is we get somebody registers, they give us a password, we generate a random hash for this user, or sorry, a random salt for this user, append that to the end of their password, hash the the uh, password with the salt, hash that, store the hash and the password, and throw away the plain text password. When somebody logs in, we're going to take their username, password, take the username, look up our database, get the hash and salt for this user, take the salt, append it to the password that they just provided for login, hash that, and if that hash matches what we have stored for the stored hash for this user, then they're authenticated, and we allow them to log in. So our process isn't too much changed, just a little bit, and the rainbow tables are completely useless because the hash... The plain text password that's hashed has to have that salt appended to it, which very, very few hashes in that rainbow table, the way it's designed, are actually going to have, are actually going to end in the exact bits of that salt. So all those chains that they pre-computed, the vast majority of the values in those chains are completely useless because they don't end in that salt. So they can't be used. They can't possibly be the password that they're attacking. Uh, because uh, they don't end in that salt. Uh, another thing, another reason for salting as well is the stored hashes. If, if two people, so there are a lot of common passwords out there. If two people have the same exact password, without salting, their passwords are going to match. And it's pretty easy for an attacker to scan the database quick, run a little bit of code, collect the common passwords, and know which users to attack. These are the users with the, the easy passwords. They all have the same passwords. It's probably password or password123 or something silly like that. Uh, and then they're going to attack those accounts. Well, with salting, even with the same exact password, those hashes will be completely different. So the attacker can't launch that kind of attack either. 
So salting prevents a couple, uh, you know, a handful of uh, of attacks that could be really devastating. Gets rid of all of those. So with, with everything that we say here, I recommend just using the bcrypt library. Don't don't try to brew. This is one time where I'm like, don't homebrew your own authentication, your own security, your own encryption, and everything. Uh, not encryption. We didn't talk about encryption yet. Uh, don't homebrew, but it will be true for encryption as well. Don't homebrew your own stuff for that use the bcrypt library this is one thing where where the exercise of going through like implementing sha-256 i i don't want to show you doing that at all i don't want to say yeah implement your own hash function or anything when it comes to security like this uh let's not take any chances you should always always use a standard uh a, an industry accepted library bcrypt is that library for uh, for authentication uh, even when you use a different library, it's probably using bcrypt under the hood. Possibly you'll find out when you do your, your reports for your authentication libraries if you're not using bcrypt. Bcrypt doesn't need to report because you're allowed to use it on your homework. Homework project, use bcrypt or some other library. Uh, if you use a different library, you got to write a report to show that it is actually hashing and doing what you want. I've seen quite a bit of like using Django authentication. Or you just say, Django, do it all for me. Uh, if you're doing that, uh, you, I, I haven't looked into that one. It might be using bcrypt, but at least get to the point where it's like, here's where it actually is generating salts and hashing and then storing hashes. Um, by the way, quick side note is I see a lot of Django being used. Just so you know, Django's a trade-off. Django does a lot for you, but it's going to make your reports way more difficult to write. Because you got to get into the Django source code and really figure out what it's doing and how it's doing it. Um, whenever you use a library for your project like that, that's doing a lot for you. You're not saving. You're not saving effort. You're not, you know, getting the project done quicker. All you're doing is saying, "I want to spend a lot more time writing reports and digging around in source code than actually developing my project." So just keep that in mind when you're doing things like that. That when you take it a library that that does everything for you. I'm really looking at the reports because, you know, you can't just pull on a library that does everything for you and not do your own project. Just just keep that in mind. Um, I, I see a lot of you backing yourselves into a corner with, uh, with Django and haven't even written a single report yet. I don't think you understand how much work that's going to be at the end of the semester. So anyone in that position using Django and haven't written a report, my goodness, I don't envy you. Um, bcrypt has an implementation any language that i've looked at look for it in all the languages that you're using for your homeworks you're going to find a bcrypt library for it uh, so just use that and make sure you're using the hashing and salting in the library so the salting and hashing isn't too big of a deal pulling the library but you do have to learn how to use the library it's not too complicated i might do a demo next week we do have some time in lectures next week i'll do tokens on monday so maybe wednesday i'll give a bcrypt example Maybe I'll get into those examples that I flashed in IntelliJ. Maybe I'll get those working and show you some more uh, more examples there if you want to see them. Oh, and I walk through this process. Yeah, to walk through that process. And I guess I'll close on, and we got one minute. I can tell this in one minute. Is... Uh, You'll see on the news every once in a while, you see see breaking news where there's a lot of, uh, it's fairly often, it's almost accepted these days, where every once in a while you're going to have a database breach. You're, you're going to read company X leaks millions of something. And that something is usually like credit card numbers. It'll be social security numbers. It'll be emails, addresses. Um, it'll be, you know, whatever that company is storing for you financial information what you don't see headlines of or at least you shouldn't or else the company is absolutely horrible what you won't see headlines of is millions of user accounts compromised you won't see you don't see those headlines you don't see all these people's passwords are are now in the attacker's hands you don't see those headlines because those passwords are salted and hashed for any developer who's worth their pun intended salt is uh, is going to be salting their 
salting and hashing their passwords and storing those. So even when an attacker gets the database, they still don't get your password. But there's a lot of information in that database that can't be hashed, like credit cards. When you store your credit card in a when a credit card is stored in a database, you can encrypt it, but you have to do it in a way that it can be decrypted. You can't hash it. You can't hash it in a one-way sense because what's the point of storing a hash of your credit card? What happens when you want to make a payment and Visa is expecting your actual credit card number? You have to unhash it, which is not something that hashing is meant to do. Passwords can be hashed because nobody ever needs to know your password. But people do need to know your credit card number, so you can't store a hash of the credit card number. So that's why you see database was breached and all these credit card numbers are now in the attacker's hands. That does happen because you can't do the same thing. You can encrypt, but if you're encrypting the credit card numbers, which they should be encrypted, if you're encrypting the credit card pass, credit card numbers and storing them in a database and an attacker has access to that database, but you also need to decrypt them in normal operation of the, the app, that means they have access to the database and somewhere close by is going to be the decryption key. So if an attacker has access to the database, they can probably find that key as well, find the encryption key, decrypt the database, and then have all those passwords, uh, have all those credit card numbers. But they can't do the same thing with passwords. You won't see massive breaches with passwords unless somebody's not salting and hashing.